Okay. Well, good evening and welcome to this, the final, almost final installment of the Hagen History Center's Fall 2021 Speaker Series. I'm Jeff Sherry, and I'm museum educator at the Hagen History Center. And our speaker tonight is Mr. Mark Squillia. Mark is a longtime friend of the Historical Society. He's also the vice president of the board of directors and a longtime friend of mine as well. We share an interest in military history, especially World War II. A researcher into World War II history, especially, Mark has put together a talk tonight on the Malmody Massacre. This is the during the 1944 Battle of the Bulge, but I'll leave a lot of this to Mark. And two Erie soldiers, one who lived and one who did not. Before I turn it over to Mark, just a brief word from the Hagen History Center. We are currently open 10 to 5, Tuesday through Friday, and noon, Saturday, and, and noon to 5, Saturday and Sunday. Check our website at www.eriehistory.org to check out a wide variety of historical articles and blogs. Now our speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Mr. Mark Squillia. Mark? Thank you, Jeff. As Jeff mentioned this evening, we're going to talk about Ken Aaron's Erie's survivor and witness to the Malmaday massacre. Uh, this cover slide shows the display at the Hagen History Center Wood Morrison House. This document is Aaron's copy of the war crimes trial documentation he was given uh, because he testified in the war crimes trial against the SS unit that perpetrated these war crimes in killing the prisoners of war. It is on display in the Wood Morrison House at the Hagen History Center. I'll talk a little bit later on the other documentation that the Hagen History Center possesses on Aaron's and is located in their archives. Uh, also in that display case down here is a picture of Aaron's on the witness stand at the war crimes trial. And later on in these slides, you'll see a better photo of that. Over on this side of, of the slide is a picture of Aaron's roughly in mid to late spring 1946, when he and other survivors returned to the site uh, in Belgium. And it was at the dedication of a memorial put up by the Belgian government. Uh, we assume that it's early to mid-1946, given the fact that the six survivors are still in uniform, so they are still on active duty. So who was Ken Ahrens, and what did he do prior to the war? Before we talk about that, I'd like to make mention of Erie County's contribution to the war effort during World War II. It's hard to ascertain how many of Erie County's sons and daughters served during World War II, but the numbers had to be fairly significant. Given the fact that 700, 700 plus, I'm sorry, sons and daughters gave their lives during World War II, and they served in every branch of service during the war and in every theater of operations, even the obscure theaters, China, Burma, India, the Middle East, some of the theaters that we never see, hear, or read about, or books are published about. So Erie natives served all over the globe during the war. We're gonna talk about how Aaron's ended up at Malmaday, but before that, Ken was born to Mr. and Mrs. Otto Aarons, and during his high school years, he lived at 503 Andrews Park Boulevard. And I had to go look on Google Maps to see where Andrews Park Boulevard was. And as you can see down here, it is just east of this green patch, which is Lakeside Cemetery, uh, which is just east of the old hair mill property, now Hero BX. There's other, some, there are other 
known landmarks around 503 Andrews Park Boulevard, which is just north of East Lake Road, specifically Ricardo's Restaurant, which everybody is familiar with, and the GE Transportation Plant, now known as Wabtec. Ken graduated from East in 1940. He was born in 1923, and unfortunately, his mother died in 1939 when Ken was young. Um, as we can see from his high school description, he was quite the accomplished musician. And then down below here is a picture with Ken and his high school mates and he is identified by the green circle. Ken was drafted in 1942, roughly late 42, entered military service in January of 43, and was assigned to the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion. Did his training at Fort Sill, Oklahoma and Fort Gruber, Oklahoma. We will talk a little bit about what a Field Artillery Observation Battalion does a little bit later in, in the discussion. Prior to going overseas with the 285th, Ken married Dorothy Bryce, and they had a son, David, who was born in July of 1944. How did we get to Malma Day? Malma Day happened on December 17th, 1944. But to understand how we got there, or how we arrived there, we need to go back and look at the entire Western European theater specifically starting with D-Day on June 6, 1944. As everyone knows, the Allies landed in Normandy on the morning of June 6, 44, the British and the Americans landing on the Normandy beaches. Subsequent to D-Day, the Battle of Normandy consisted of the next seven to eight weeks of roughly slogging through the Norman hedgerow land and losing and inflicting high numbers of casualties because of the fighting, the defensive nature that the Germans were able to portray uh, in the hedgerows really caused the fighting to be of high number of casualties. Towards the end of July, under the command of General Omar Bradley and George Patton, Patton's Third Army broke out of the hedgerow country and approached down to the neck of the Brittany Peninsula. When he reached the Brittany Peninsula, he pivoted both east and west simultaneously, thereby encircling or wrapping around the German Seventh Army. The German Seventh Army was held in check by General Omar Brad, or excuse me, General Bernard Montgomery at Caen, and the British at Caen occupied predominantly the majority of German armor, which allowed Patton to free wheel across mid France. As the German Seventh Army retreated across France, the Allies approached the Seine vaulted the Seine, passed Paris, and began the race across the rest of France. But as they raced across France, the advance began to falter. And it was due in large part to the lack of supplies. Being able to supply all of those armies advancing on a broad front. That was Eisenhower's strategy. Everybody to advance across France, and the Low Countries, Belgium, simultaneously. But carting supplies over the beaches at Normandy was impossible to supply all of these troops and have them progress at the same pace. So the need for a deep water port to allow ships to dock and unload supplies was focused on Antwerp. Unfortunately, Antwerp was not secured until late September of 19... troops. 
at this point, Eisenhower should have commanded Montgomery to clear the Schwelt estuary, but he acceded to Montgomery's wishes to launch Operation Market Garden. And Market Garden's purpose was to attack through Holland to Arnhem and secure a bridge over the Lower Rhine, which would put the Allied troops above the Siegfried Line, over the Rhine, and basically behind the Siegfried Line, enabling them to come down into the German industrial heartland of the Saar and Ruhr Basin. Um, Market Garden, and we all know the story, a bridge too far, although it was a single attack over a single road which strangled the attack not being able to reach Arnhem, the attack failed. Um, so then we see late September, October of 1944, and basically the American armies, the British Second Army, and the Canadian First Army stalemated um, in the vicinity of the, of the German frontier. The American First Army attempts to capture the Roar River dams. And this was important because the Roar River dams, if they were opened, would flood the front of the American First Army, making it virtually impossible for them to advance. The Hurtigen Forest was a absolute bloody affair for an attempt to capture the Roar River dams. Um, where we see the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion attached to the U.S. 28th Division seeing action. So Aaron saw action in the Hurtigan Forest. Prior to December 15, 1944, which is the day before the Ardennes attack, represented by this red line as the front line, the Germans were poised to make an attack. Hitler, back in September and October, began husbanding resources, pulling troops from the Eastern Front, collecting tanks to make one last desperate offensive. And he wanted to attack through the Ardennes. Bradley looked at the Ardennes as a rest area. And that's why we see it being very thinly held. We'll see that on the next slide being very thinly held by U.S. troops, predominantly who had fought through the Hurtgen Forest and were resting and recuperating in the Ardennes. The attack, the surprise attack on the 16th through the Ardennes was probably the second most largest U.S. Army intelligence failure of World War II, second only to Pearl Harbor. All the signs were there the U.S. Army S-2 did not foresee the attack. They also thought the Ardennes was not an avenue of attack because it was very hilly, highly wooded, and had very few roads. Unfortunately, just four, four years earlier, Hitler attacked through the Ardennes to France and the Low Countries and basically raced from the Ardennes to the Channel Coast in roughly two and a half weeks, three weeks. So history does repeat itself. As I said, Hitler's objectives were to drive north towards Antwerp. His goal was to split the Allied forces. If we go back to this slide, if he breaks through the Ardennes, and he moves up towards Antwerp, he can cut off the U.S. Ninth Army, the British Second Army, the Canadian First Army, not only from the other U.S. armies, but also from their supply lines. His hope is that if he can break through, that the Allies will begin to disagree, argue, and he potentially can force a political solution to the war. They might, the Allies might quit fighting. They may broker a separate peace from the Russians. And then he can focus and turn all of his forces to the east and defeat the communists. If we look at the map, 
the mileage between the German frontier and Antwerp obviously is much shorter in the northern part of the bulge. And that's what this map depicts. It's the extent of the German penetration into the US lines. But if we look at the specifically the 6th Panzer Army man, headed by Sepp Dietrich, who was originally Hitler's bodyguard. Um, Dietrich commanded the 6th Panzer Army, whose goal was to break through the US lines and drive to Way, where there were bridges over the Meuse River, which then they could launch an attack towards Antwerp. The tip of the spear of the 6th Panzer Army was the 1st SS Panzer Division commanded by Walter Monkey. And the point of the tip of that spear was the 1st SS Panzer Regiment commanded by Joachim Piper. Now, let's talk a little bit about the SS Panzer, the 1st SS Panzer Division. They originated as Hitler bought Hitler's bodyguards. They were ardent Nazi supporters. In late 1939, it was decided that the, the group would become a Waffen SS division, which means they are a fighting element and not concentration guards, which a lot of the SS troops were. They fought predominantly at the beginning of the war on the Eastern Front. And there's a record of this division committing numerous atrocities. They considered themselves Hitler's own. As I said, they were ardent Nazis. And prior to the Ardennes attack, in Piper's direction to his regiment, he stressed that speed was of the essence. They were to disregard their flanks. They were to disregard anything that could get in their way of breaking through the Allied lines, getting to the bridges over the Meuse, and then onto Antwerp. He indicated that they should fight with no compassion, similar to the way they fought on the Eastern Front. And importantly, he stressed that prisoners were not to be of their concern. Now, this message was given to the German officers who then obviously gave that message to the German enlisted troops. Again, if we look at the bulge as a whole, I mentioned how thinly held our lines were. Here we see the 28th Division, which is Pennsylvania's own, the Keystone Division, who fought at the Hurtgen Forest in the middle of the bulge, holding the middle of the line um, and their idea was this was a rest and recreation area because nothing had happened on this front for quite some time. Down in the southern part of the line, we see the 4th Division. Again, fought at the Hurtgen Forest, severely bled, needed to recoup and rest and refit. A little further north, the 106th Division. The newest division on the continent arrived a week and a half to two weeks ago got put into the line, and this is the first division made up primarily of 18-year-old draftees. And then we see the 99th division, another new division to the continent, um, not bloodied, had not seen any action. But we're looking at roughly a 100-mile front held by four divisions, all infantry divisions, facing roughly a quarter of a million Germans, 700 plus tanks and numerous guns. So it's a thinly held front. Again, the German commanders of the 6th SS Panzer Army, Sepp Dietrich, 5th Panzer Army, Hasso von Manteuffel, 7th Army, Eric Brandenburger, and commanding the entire front uh, of Army Group B is Walter Model. This is the extent of the German penetration, um, and they began their retreat after the Allies began, began closing the bulge, uh, probably in early to mid-January. So how was Aaron's at Malmedy on December 7th, 1944? 
And how did Battery B, 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion, cross paths with Piper's 1st SS Panzer Regiment? Number one, a field artillery observation battalion is a non-combatant unit. They are not on the front lines. They are not fighting. As their name indicates, they are an observation group. Their job is to observe enemy artillery, look for flashpoints using some technology probably, eyesight, and then report that observation back to US artillery for counter battery fire. They are armed strictly with M1 Garands, Colt 45s. They carry no heavy weapons. They have no armor. They are not a fighting unit. What we see is they were attached to the US 7th Armored Division, and they were located in Uppen, Germany on the morning of December 16th. Once Piper breaks through, and attacks on the northern part of the bulge, the U.S. 7th Armored and the 285th U.S. Field Artillery Observation Battalion are ordered to south to St. Vith. St. Vith, let me go back because this map is a little bigger, bigger and better to view. If we look at St. Vith, which is right here, we see that St. Vith is a crossroads. We don't see many roads going through the area of the Ardennes or the Bulge. We see four major roads going into St. Vith, probably more, as we see eight major roads going into Bastogne in the southern part of the Bulge. Bastogne and the 101st Airborne holding Bastogne gets all of the publicity during the Battle of the Bulge. Many books have been written about the 101st and their stand at Bastogne, and yes, it was critically important. But the 7th Armored stand at St. Vith was just as important at holding the 6th SS Panzer Army from breaking through entirely and approaching the bridges over the Meurs and then on to Antwerp. So the 285th was traveling south with the 7th Armored. They were coming through the town of Malmede. They were to head south to a small little hamlet, which was probably not more than six or seven or 10 houses, the Bagnier's Crossroads, which is referred to as Five Points. And they were then to come down this road and then proceed south to St. Vith. So they were basically heading east southeast and then turn directly south to head to St. Fifth and that's that road right there. It just so happened that they were interspersed with columns convoys of 7th Armored Division. They just happened to be in the middle of two convoys. This morning of the December 17th, a 7th Armored Convoy goes through Malmade, goes through Five Points, continues on to St. Vith. The next convoy is the 285th, which is heading south, or excuse me, southeast. And they happen to hit the crossroads at the same time that Piper's group is heading west. So what occurs? We had 26 trucks in the 285th convoy. And this is the road that they were traveling on. This is that road on the map. This is the turn they were to make to head to St. Fifth. This is Piper's group heading west, and they collide head on with the 285th. The tracks of the 285th are fired on by the lead tanks and half tracks of, of Piper's group. Again, I said the 285th is armed only with small arms and they were no match against tanks, machine guns, automatic weapons, the such. They bail out of the trucks that are on fire from the German tanks. They occupy the ditches on both sides of the road. And as the Germans, Panzer Grenadiers come out, 
they begin to surrender because they can see there's no place for them to go. They're herded into this open field right here across the Cafe Baudelaire. And as Piper's group is traveling, they are beginning to move in this direction. Um, rumor has it they were apprised of the fact that there was an American general in Ligonville and they were trying to capture that American general, which is why they didn't continue on to the West. They turned south for a period of time. In any event, their, their armored column is traveling along this road, passing about 100 POWs who are now gathered in this field. And one of the vehicles stops. Two German enlisted men stand up with pistols and they fire a couple of shots, dropping a couple of American POWs. Immediately, German machine guns on the tanks and automatic weapons held by German soldiers begin to open fire on all 100 of the POWs. It's after the fact, it was determined that these two individuals, George Fleps and Hans Siptrat, were the first two who fired the pistol shots. It was almost as if a signal, those pistol shots were almost a signal for the machine guns and the automatic weapons to open up on the, on the American POWs. But if you go back to what I said earlier about the SS methodology and the way that they were instructed to fight, it's not a surprise. FLEPS and SIPTRAT were commanded by Lieutenant Eric Rumpf, who indicated that he was under orders to execute POWs. But who gave that order? Piper never specifically said execute POWs, but as I said, the message was almost implied. What happens to Aaron's? Aaron's is wounded, as many others are. Uh, excuse me, let me go back. After the initial machine gunning, and the majority, if not all, of the 100 POWs are down. German soldiers begin to walk through the field with pistols and they begin, or rifles, and they begin to kick or try to attempt to ascertain whether anyone is still alive. And if there's questions, they're firing in the backs of the American POW's heads. So many who survived the initial volley of machine guns are killed by pistol shots or rifle shots or a uh, rifle butt to the head um, in what's deemed as a mercy killing. And these SS troops were almost making a sport of this killing, enjoying it, laughing. That is eyewitness accounts from Aaron's and others who survived. Aaron and others feign death. Aaron himself says that the man lying to his right and to his left were both shot in the back of the head. He expected to be killed next, but for some reason, the Germans passed him over. He and a couple others, after hours of laying in the snow, make it back to Malmaday, and it took a couple of hours for them to walk the couple of miles back to uh, the town of Malmaday. It's unfathomable that this killing field where we see the American POWs killed, if these soldiers are feigning death and then getting up and running, they're running roughly 200 yards to the next wooded area to, to find cover. So how they were able to do that without being seen by German troops or shot is, is surprising. Um, Aaron's escapes with another soldier called Al Valenzi. Um, back in, after the war, at a very old age, Al Valenzi writes a letter 
and I'd like to read that letter. Uh, this letter is in the archives at the Hagen History Center. Letters dated September 26, 2004, um, roughly, probably a month before Ken Aarons passes away. To whom it may concern, Kenneth Aarons and I were members of B Battery of the 285th Field Artillery Observation Battalion. At about noon on December 17th, 1944, we were attacked by the German SS and Bagnés, Belgium. Under heavy fire, we could do nothing but surrender. Many men were wounded. We were searched and herded into a field. Machine gun and every and anyone alive were finished off with a pistol shot. Without Sergeant Aaron's help, without regard for his life, for his own life, I am able to write this letter. He figured that we should escape together. He was hit in the back and I was hit in the legs. Sergeant Aaron helped me up and we started to run. I couldn't run too far. So Ken had to slow down to help me get started again. I would fall and Aaron's would stop to help me up. We were under heavy machine gun fire and it was a miracle that, that we weren't cut down. Ken was determined to save me and he did it at great risk. We have kept in touch for 60 years, calling each other on December 17th. Respectfully yours, Albert Valenzi, B Battery 285th. And the letter was also notarized by a notary public. So that tells you a little bit about Ken Aarons' character. All told, 84 of the 100 American POWs were killed. As the survivors made it back to US lines and they explained what happened, the word of these atrocities spread through the US ranks and it spread like wildfire. Uh, absolutely US divisions pledged that they would take no prisoners, especially they would take no SS troops as prisoners or German paratroopers. Um, but the, this SS division, the atrocities weren't committed strictly on US soldiers. They killed civilians um, and there's different accounts across the entire Ardennes of Belgian civilians being killed by German troops. So this wasn't a isolated event. We talked about Aaron's being a survivor and he is Erie's only survivor and, live, and at the time living witness of the Malmö Day Massacre. But we would be remiss if we didn't mention Corporal Carl Ruhlman, who also was of Erie. Here we see a photo of Ruhlman who graduated from East in 1941, a year behind Aaron's. I'm assuming that they knew each other coming from Erie, being in a small outfit together, they had to have known each other. Um, but Rollman was one of, the, one of the 100, or excuse me, 84 that were killed by the SS troops on December 17th. Here's a picture of his body, which was discovered a month later in January when the US troops recaptured um, the Five Points Crossroad. And here's a picture of his gravestone, which is in Lakeside Cemetery. So Aaron is wounded. He goes to um, a hospital in Europe, and then he's brought back to the States. Uh, we proceed to the summer of 45. Piper and, and the war is over in Europe. The war ends in, in April or excuse me, May. Um, Hitler kills himself in April. The Germans surrender in May. The Russians occupy Berlin and the war is over. Piper and his men are brought to an internment camp. So they were known and they were found uh, all across Germany or wherever they were and they were brought to a single camp. They were interrogated intensely post them bringing to, or coming to that camp. 
the investigators who were performing the interrogation in the end used very questionable methods per U.S. standards. Um, so this, the, um, the investigations and the subsequent documentation um, were all part of the war cr crimes trial in May of 1946. Here we see that picture of Aaron's on the witness stand at that trial um, testifying. This picture is of the witnesses testify, or who testified occupying the spot on the killing field um, for the events that happened on December 17th. I can't imagine what went through their minds as they were standing in that field. As a result of the trial, 43 SS troopers, including Piper, were sentenced to death. In 1948, Lucius Clay, General Lucius Clay, who was the uh, commanding officer of the American Occupation Forces in Germany, commutes 31 of the 43 sentences due to pressure back home because of the methods that were used to gain the confessions of the accused. And by, by mid-1950, all sentences were commuted and Piper was released. Aaron's returns to Erie. He resides at 222, or excuse me, 222, yes, 222 Sanford Place, which is just east of Parkside. He's the payroll operations manager at GE Erie Works. Here's a picture of him sitting in building 14, which still stands today on the GE property. Um, sometime in the 50s, when GE moved quite a bit of their operations to Louisville, Aaron's moved to Louisville. He worked for GE for 38 years, retiring from the company, and he died on October 12th, 2004. Shortly after Valenzi wrote that letter, uh, September 26th, so not more than three weeks. That concludes the lecture, Jeff. Um, I can be reached at msquag at gmail.com for questions if we don't have any to go over now. But let me go over um, some of the information that's in the archives. As I said, there's quite a bit of uh, Aaron's information at the Hagen History Center. There's a multitude of newspaper clippings related to Aaron's during the war, during the massacre, after the war, during the trial. The letter that I read from Valenzi is in the archives as well as Aaron's medals, including the purple, his Purple Heart and the Bronze Star. Uh, correspondence from Senator Mitch McConnell uh, in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s to Aaron's and his family, as well as information and photos from a 1964 trip that Aaron's took back to Malma Day. And if you'd rather read about the bulge and the Malma Day massacre, I suggest The Bitter Woods by John S.D. Eisenhower, yes, Dwight Eisenhower's son, and Battleground, The Story of the Bulge by John Tolan. Specific, these books mention and annotate the Malma Day Massacre. They do not go into the detail that this book by Parker, Fatal Crossroads, or The Massacre at Malma Day by Charles Whitting does. Um, that's it, Jeff. Mark, what a fantastic talk. You know, four years ago, when I first started the Circle Society, the family, and I don't, don't ask me who, brought in these items. And I looked at those then and I thought, this is a wealth of information about it. And here's an eerie guy who survives this tragic, tragic and, and historic event. I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's been portrayed in a lot of films, but they never go into any detail. They just show American POWs being gunned down. Uh, I, I think you did a fantastic job to, you know, link his enrollment. My goodness. Um, 
that was that's new on us. That's that's new for you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, to have uh-huh. Ruhlman's uh, role in this, Carl Ruhlman, and his burial site in Lakeview. You did a fantastic yeah. job. So I, I have a couple of questions. We don't have any viewer questions right now on Facebook, but I have a couple of comments or questions. How would you, um, uh, you did address the fact that the, the idea of no prisoners on the part of the Americans after the word reached the rear areas that they weren't going to take any prisoners. Do you have any idea how many, you know, things were carried out by American troops after that? No, there's Anybody, does anyone <laughs> of all of all the readings that I've done, um, it's very, very sparsely reported. I, I, I mean, I, I know of um, U.S. troops killing German POWs in Sicily. That's attributed directly to Patton. Um, and I'm sure there were occasions in France and obviously in the Battle of the Bulge, but the documentation is, is very sparse. I, I see, I have yet to uncover any evidence of that. Um, okay. But I'm sure there it occurred. was one account that I read not too long ago, probably read it years ago too, but I reread that General Matthew Maxwell Taylor of the 101st had told officers and men prior to D-Day that we have objectives, we're not going to be slowed down by prisoners of war. And some of, you probably have seen that too, and there's some some rationalization that the gunning down of some German POWs by an American officer of the 101st, you know, surely after D-Day or on D-Day may have been caused by, you know, what we were told not to take in a POW. Now, I am not justifying what the Nazis did at yeah. Malmedy, but, uh, yeah. You know, it, uh, war is ugly. Yeah. War is just plain I, ugly. I, I think, you know, in, in the first SS Panzer Division's case, unfortunately, I think that was, I don't want to say that was their standard practice, but they had a history. They had a precedent of killing POWs, killing civilians. Um, the owner of the cafe that I mentioned, um, I believe, if I'm correct, she had a son. Even though she was Belgian, they were on the frontier. She had a son that was conscripted into the German army. And she, the German SS troops thought she was harboring American POWs. Um, they burned her cafe to the ground and she's never, never been found. So suspicion is the the ss troops killed her as well um and there's like i said there's accounts of, of all through the northern part of of the bulge uh specifically the ss troops killing uh civilians not so much the regular wehrmacht the german army um as much as the ss so right. that was their mo uh, unfortunately and it was just as i tried to explain an unfortunate twist of fate that the 285th cross paths with with the first SS Panzer Regiment. I mean, the, the minor league team, little league team, rang into the, you know, yeah, the yeah. Red Sox. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, normally exactly. that would not have occurred. Um, right. Unfortunate. Right. Um, no. You mentioned Rollman, and um, interesting. I, I received a phone call around four o'clock this afternoon from Judge Michael Dunleavy who wanted to, and I, you and I, I think had talked about this. He wanted to remind me that uh, Judge Dimitrovich's father, Stephen, was the last living survivor of the Malmaday massacre. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. And he was part of the um, 575th Ambulance Company. I, I, how he ended up with that group, I, I don't know. Um, I'm going to have to go back into Parker's book and see if there's any reference to it. That name but, now, I I did not connect to the judge, but that name, Steve Dimitrovich, that's yeah. ringing a bell from Parker's book, I believe. Yeah, and yeah. I think there might be a YouTube video out there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Where he's interviewed? Yeah. Yes, I believe so. Some of the interviews 
or not interview, excuse me, the, the film of the testimony of the soldiers, the survivors, are hard to watch. Uh, Lieutenant Virgil Larry, the, so I believe the only surviving officer, he's pretty clear and straightforward. One of the poor guys can't even tell you where he's from. Yeah. Um, and I, I have yet to find Aaron's uh, actual testimony, whether it was on YouTube or not. But uh, these are collected by uh, a Holocaust Remembrance Society that's keeping all of these things. There's quite a bit of, of stuff there. Um, hard to watch because you have to go through the translator from German, English, English, German, but uh, worth it. Especially, especially Lieutenant Larry's testimony is, is very telling. So any of our viewers who want to look that up, it's on YouTube and just type in Malmody Massacre. And you might have to play around and look a little bit. But Mark, hey, we have still no questions from, um, from Facebook. I'd like to ask you one last question, then I'm going to uh, kind of cut you loose. I have wondered for a long time, the 285th was part of the 28th Division, but was temporarily assigned to the 7th Armored? Well, they, as an artillery observation battalion, they were attached to different divisions. So at the Hurtgen Force, they were attached to the 28th. Um, in the Bulge, I'm not if they were, I don't know if they were formally attached to the 7th Armored, but they were ordered to St. Vith along with the 7th Armored. All right. Um, would they I'm have not, worn a division patch of any kind? I don't, be, I don't believe so. I would really like to, I think, what, Jeff, what we need to do is talk to uh, someone who was in the military and yeah. understand, understand <laughs> how those ancillary units right. were attached right. to right. divisions uh, because right. there was quite a bit of moving around of those those service units. I agree. Well, hey, Mark, I want to thank you again for a wonderful talk. Uh, a sober topic, but you did a fantastic job. Be sure to tune in on Wednesday, November 10th at 7 p.m. on Facebook and later on YouTube for our final speakers of 2021, <clears throat> Mary Jane Koenig and Bill Welch speaking about their book on World War I entitled Answering the Call, Erie County, Pennsylvania in World War I and the work with the Erie County World War I Centennial Committee. Mark, again, you and I, I'm sure, will talk soon about this again. But thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Thank and you, Good night, Jeff. Mark. Thank good you. Night.